Um, Carlos, over to you. <coughs> sí. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for having invited me, uh, Philip, Ed, and, and everybody here at ODI. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure being here. I think it, I believe this is my third Cape Conference, and, and I hope I do a reasonably good job, so I'm invited back in the, in, in the future. Um, this is always very stimulating for me and, and always very challenging because basically everybody who is you know, sitting over there knows more about budgeting than I, than I do. Um, and, and you know, I, I have, you know, my, my, my research agenda is, is, is very broad, and so, so I, I would say that, you know, budgeting issues are, is, is, is part more, more, than, more than a, more, more of a hobby than, than my, than the main focus of my research. But, but I, I hope, I hope that at least in my presentation I can be controversial enough uh, that I can steer some, some discussion and, and that we can, we can follow later. Uh, of course, you know, these are, these are my, my own opinions and my, my institution has no responsibility for the type of things I'm, I'm going to say uh, right now. Um, so, so let me let me just basically uh, and, and, and you know I hope that uh, you know this is a good example of how bad we do budgeting. You know, basically my presentation is like two hours long, and I have to do it in 20 minutes. So, so I hope that you know she's close enough in order to hit me when I when I when I'm way 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 over you know over my over my allocated time. So basically, let, let me give you the three main message of the of the presentation uh, because I'm sure I, I will not be able to cover all uh, in, in the in the 15 20 minutes I have. So basically, what I'm going to tell you is that the budget process, and, and let me be clear, when I'm talking about the budget process, it is a very general statement. Uh, here I'm talking about a, any, any, anything and everything that has to do with, with budgeting. Uh, it's an intrinsic part of the policy making process. Uh, it can, we cannot study it in isolation, okay? It will be much easier uh, than, you know, if we can think that the budget process is just a technocratic process, that we can, you know, fix some things here and there and things will work. But but we have to understand that this is this is you know it goes one, you know hand in hand with the, with the policy making process, and and the budget process is one of the is is the place in which most political transactions take place, okay so so this is not something like other areas in which politics <coughs> touches from the side this is you know the, this is the core the core of the political process so so we have to understand that and we have to work given those those constraints. I will also talk a little bit about government capabilities because this, uh, this is a theme that you know will will come over and over, uh, and, and clearly you know I will not say you know something that you don't know that clearly government capabilities matter, uh, but one thing I, I will I will tell you is that these are endogenous. So so we have we have thought for for many many years that we can somehow provide these exogenous shocks to uh, shocks to capabilities and things will get better, but but clearly this is this is this is not the case. And, and we need to invest in, in long-term incentive compatible areas, and I will, I will talk about that. Uh, I will be given a lot of examples from Latin America. That's, that's the area in which I work most. But I could basically give the same presentation talking about the US, which I, which I think, I think is, is, a very, is a very interesting uh, thing to, to think about uh, as, as, as we go along this, in these two days, because we tend to think that you know, most, of the, most of the problems on the budgeting process are, are you know, developing countries' problems. Uh, are problems with capacities, are problems with culture, are problems uh, of those type of things. But if you think about the U.S. now and in the last in the last few years, what you will realize is that you know it looks like a developing country. It looks like the problems that the U.S. has uh, developing a budget and approving a budget, passing a budget, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, are the type of things we have been discussing for the for the for the poorer countries uh, all along. So it gives an idea of, of how important the political process is uh, in all of this. And it also gives an idea that we can do some reforms in the, in the budget process. I'm sure many of you have some ideas on how we can tweak the budget process in the US in order to, to make it work. But it's important to say that the budget process in the US would work totally different if, if we instead change, for example, campaign finance laws. Okay, so that, that starts give you a, uh, will give you an idea of the type of things I'm, I'm, I'm referring to uh, in, my, in my presentation. So basically, you know, as I was saying, the, the budget process uh, is, is a collective process. It's a process in which uh, politicians uh, <coughs> and, and policymakers engage uh, basically in a, in a daily basis. And each one has their own motivations and incentives. We have understood that for, for, for long, and, and, and we have been referring uh, about that uh, already today. But the key is that most of the time we have looked at this as an issue in which we can do uh, uh, reforms on the margin. So we know that there is an incentive for legislators to, you know, to pass pork barrel in proje uh, uh, projects. 
we have, you know, worked with budget institutions thinking that somehow certain budget institutions could limit these incentives of the legislators, but we haven't still looked at the, the whole political process uh, in the general equilibrium perspective, and those are the type of things that, that I, I will be referring to. And, and probably, you know, if, if I don't, I'm not able to cover this, you, you can look at the presentation later on, and I have also added some, some, some references for, for, further, for further study. So the key here is that if we don't look at the budget process in its entirety and, and as a part of a general equilibrium process, clearly the type of policy recommendations we can do will be unre unreliable and unrealistic. So give me just go very, very rapidly through a series of examples uh, that will give, you know, an, a, an idea of the type of things I'm talking about. So for example, one of the things is compliance with formal rules. So for those of us who have been working in, in the developing world, we know that sometimes uh, we design a law, uh, we pass a reform, and, and it's not, you know, it does not work. So one good example has have been the fiscal responsibility laws. Uh, in some places have worked perfectly, in the case of Brazil, in others have not worked as, as well. Uh, and, and most of the, of the analysis always has been on the details of the law, uh, and not so much on what is the role of the law in the, in the more general uh, political, political economy process. So, so you, can, you can, for example, say that uh, in, the, in the early 2000s, the law worked in Brazil and not in Argentina because the law had in Brazil uh, some very clear enforcement mechanisms of what, of what will happen to people who did not complain the law, uh, comply with the law, uh, and it did not have that in, in Argentina. Uh, however, uh, the fact that somehow the law was going to be enforced, and the fact that in Brazil there was there were investments on the on the what is called the tribunais de contas, on the auditing agencies at the at the local level, and how the local level. And the and the, and the, the federal level uh, incentives were aligned for making this to work uh, is more important than the than the than the law in itself. And I had an example. This is this is basically what happened in Argentina in the early 2000s. So basically, fiscal responsibility law was enacted. The blue line tells you what were the limits. So basically, just to give you an idea, for 1999, the the deficit was supposed to be up to two percent of GDP, and it was going to be. Uh, should, should be decreasing until you know 2003, in which a year in which balanced budgets had to be enacted. And as you see, what happened in reality was that the law was not complied with in 1999. It was not complied in 2000. So the idea was okay. There was a problem with the law. Let's reform the law. Let's change. Let's, this time we will be more realistic. So the law was was changed in 2001. The limits were raised. The idea was okay. We have we are in the in the, in the financial distress. Let's you know. Let's put new limits. So, you know, the limits were raised, and as you can imagine, again the law was not complied with. You know, in any of the of the following years. So again, again, we can we can think that there was a, a problem with the with the with the details of the law, the way the way it was implemented. But clearly, one, once you start to understand what were the incentives of the federal government of the provinces at that time, you can understand why it was not supposed to work to begin with. So an another thing is that where the budget is a reliable document or, or, or not, and this is this is something that is important. Again, uh, we look at the budgets and we see that some countries underestimate revenues. We see so that some other countries uh, overestimate revenues. We believe that the medium medium term fiscal frameworks will solve you know any and every one of the problems, uh, and we believe that this is an issue of capacity. These countries are not able to uh, to estimate you know fiscal accounts very well. But actually, when you go, and you, you will see very clear patterns in which the discretion that the countries have in the, in the, in the budget process explain what happens in the, in the, in the previous stages. What, what I'm talking about, basically, the executive needs, needs some discretion during the budget process in order to build coalitions. So if the budget gives some discretion for the, to, the, to the president in order to cut expenditures, if revenues do not reach the, 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 the expected levels, then in this country, what you will see is you know, a systematic overestimation of revenues, so it gives the president discretion over the year. In other countries, you have the opposite. You have the president who, who can uh, allocate budget uh, discretionary if the, revenues do not, uh, the, if the revenues are in excess of what the budget has established. So what you see is systematic underestimation. So the president has this, uh, this nice cushion to use over the years in order to uh, execute execute the budget. Again, we can think that the medium-term fiscal framework will solve this. 
clearly is at the core of the political incentives of all the actors uh, involved. Another interesting thing, which which also um, uh, it was it was mentioned in the, in the previous in the previous stage, is that we have tend to believe that ex that you know budgeting ends at the approval, and, and we have come to believe about this mainly when because we have looked at the developing at uh, the developed countries. So in the U.S., most of the discussion basically takes place up to approval. After that, everything is more or less uh, systematic and, and, and sequential. When you look at the at the developing countries, this is not the case. Um, most of the action usually takes place after approval and during the during the, the year, and and this is a play, and this is a, a case in which the actors are playing sequential games. So just give me let me give you a, a, a very rough picture and, and and I have to rush, but basically this each one of these bars for for each one of these countries show changes you know in the in the budget over the over the different stages of the budget. So the first basically uh, the first bar the green bar shows the changes that take place during the approval. Okay, so the, basically the executive sends the, sends the budget to, to, to Congress, and for example, in, 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 you know, if you see Ecuador, Colombia, and Brazil, basically the Congress reallocates the budget in you know, a little bit less than 2% of the total budget. So basically, we are talking here, these are, these are for you know, the big, the big agreement, uh, aggregates. So basically, you know, 2% of the, of, the, of the money will be shifted from one place to the other. So, not much happens uh, in most of these countries. So basically, let's say that Congress tends to approve basically what comes from the from the from from the Congress. But if you look at the other two bars, you will see that you know how much is reallocated during the year. So basically, the blue bar shows that the changes that take place over the year uh, in the in, in the in the budget law, uh, and the and the red line shows the the changes that happen during execution. So basically. I don't know if we take if we take Bolivia as an example. So more than twenty something percent percentage points of GDP is reallocated eh, of of the budget is reallocating during the year. So basically, the budget you end up allocating eh, executing is totally different, completely different to the budget that was that was approved. So I will I will I will have to rush because I have already spent like twelve minutes and not even I not even have in in, in 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 half of my presentation. So. Just let me give you a, 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 a brief overview uh, of, of the type of things I, I will talking about. So another thing is that not everybody plays the game. So we think that if you look at the formal prerogatives, we can understand what the political economy process will be uh, will be about. However, when you go and look, you see that this is not what happened. You see congresses, which in paper are very powerful, who are not interested at all in participating in the process. They are not interested in changing. Uh, the budget law that comes from the from the president, they are not interested in auditing the accounts, and they are not interested on on doing much on project on project allocation. And the same happens to auditing oceans. And again, why is that? Is because that's not where the real game is being played. Uh, so this is important uh, to understand. Another thing that is important to understand is that the budget process is a, is a living system. And, and again, you can see it in the in the in the case of the of the U.S. Uh, political wins affect the dynamics of the budget process. Changes to the campaign finance law affect the dynamic of the, of, of the budget process. Uh, political reforms, such as in, in Colombia, the changes in the electoral law affect the budget, the budget process. So we sometimes will find the explanation for why things are not working in the budget process way, way far from the areas in which we usually look at. And something that is interesting is that sometimes reform to the budget process have unintended consequences <coughs> elsewhere else. Okay, and, and, and one of the areas that I have been studying lately is the role of budget institutions in, 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 other, in other areas. So for example, clearly fiscal institutions reduce the fiscal commons problem, but we have found that it also, they reduce also separation of power and create other kind of incentives for the, for the central government uh, to do. Uh, they, they may uh, have some virtues, uh, generate some virtuous cycles in, in other areas, but I will, I will not stop, stop here. And the last point I'm going to, to, to do about this part of the presentation is that fiscal areas are interrelated. The same way I was talking about how much interrelated is the, is the political game with the budget process, also other political, <coughs> uh, other fiscal fiscal areas. And we have looked at this uh, across several areas. And what you will see is that when you, ha you have to do fiscal reform, sometimes you can do it through the budget, but sometimes you will do it through taxation or through the decentralization or concentration concentration process. Again, so. The same way that we cannot look at the budget process in, isola in isolation of the, of the political process, we cannot look 
at the budget process and the reforms to the budget in, as, in isolation of what's going on in the taxation and on the decentralization side. So I hope I have convinced or at least at least give you some, some ideas. Let me let me just go quickly to, to the other two topics. So do government capabilities matter? Yes, they do. This is not, not, nothing new, and we have done plenty of research, and we are doing uh, plenty of research right now about you know what is the impact of, of many, many things. Just to give you a brief idea, this is just shows how government capabilities generate a be better policies. Uh, this is this is a, a previous word I have that with, with Mariano Tomasi. Basically, they lead to better policies for, for growth, for productivity, and so on and so on. But it's interesting that they also lead to better uh, public financial management. So this, this is some work that we have done on performance-based budgeting, and what you see is that you see a very strong uh, positive correlation between the quality of the bureaucracy and the ability of the countries to uh, advance on performance-based budgeting uh, reforms. Uh, of course, it's, this is not for everybody, but, but many, many countries have, have advanced. But, as, but, but again, it's, not, it's neither a magic bullet. That nobody could say that today's US problems are, are, are an issue of, of lack of capacity, and clearly it cannot be externally imposed. Uh, we have tried in many, many countries in Latin America, trying to impose uh, uh, CBOs, trying to do a le legislative strengthening program, programs and do not necessarily work. Uh, so this cannot be externally uh, imposed. And why? So because, again, building and accumulating capacities is endogenous to the political process. And so I'm, I'm going back full circle, full circle again. The fact that a country builds capacities has a lot to do with the political process and how they have to, they have to uh, adjust. Uh, again, if we, if we use the U.S. instead of using Latin America, one of the reasons why the U.S. has built such a strong uh, committees and, and, and why is that um, uh, seniority has been so important was because that was the way for the political parties to increase party discipline. Okay? It was not because uh, any of us came and said to the U.S., you need to build capacities here, here and there. So it has to be incentive compatible uh, within, uh, within Congress. Uh, and just let me give you, uh, just give you an example. A former president, for example, you know, after, after an election in which they have lost the majority in Congress, his response was, if they want to get us out from every one of the committees, let them do it. We have the streets of the people. So clearly this shows that, uh, this shows that in, in this country, Congress was not a place to do business. Congress was not a place that was going to be what we call institutionalized. Capacities were not being built, and this is, was, you know, this is a medium to high, to high um, income countries. So, so what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that, again, again here it, what is important is where, where the actors are putting their, their investments. So the government capabilities are an equilibrium outcome over time of endogenous choices by key political actors. And, and, you know, and I, 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 I have some reference there for you, for you to follow. And so let me, let me just close before, before Marta starts you know, kicking, kicking, me, kicking me under, under the table. Uh, but the, the, the thing is that what, what is that we can do? Uh, and, and, and what is the main message I want to, I want to convey? Uh, in this, you know, in this very short and, and, and rushed presentation, is that we need to look at reform from a general equilibrium perspective. So, uh, Antoinette was was very clear, you know, in the sense that she said that, you know, we need to be in the field, we need to understand the political economy, uh, and this is nothing more than 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 repeating her her works. Uh, but but we need we need to be to do much more than that and, and really understand that again that the poli <laughs> that the budget process is part is at the core of the political process and things need to be incentive compatible. We are not going to convince anybody with any type of loan of doing things that are not compatible with their long-term political, political uh, incentives. Uh, so we have to be, you know, be aware of reforms that are incentive compatible, uh, and we need to find reforms that generate virtue cycles. I didn't go over, over, over this, but uh, there are many, many countries in which, very, you know, uh, uh, in which more transparency, in which in, in which lower uh, discretion would make the, the countries uh, the countries much much better. I, I remember working in a country in which credibility of the central government was so low that in order for people to believe that certain projects will be carried out, they had to basically pay the, the projects uh, up front. Okay, so instead of, of the traditional pro, uh, project cycle, they will have to come with a check and show everybody that they were they will they were giving the check to the construction industry in order to believe in order for people to believe that this was going to happen. And let me just close with, with, the, with the last point, uh, which is that what, 
what is that we can do? We in the in the in the research community, in the in the think tanks, in the at the at the at the uh, multilateral organization, is that one of the things that we can do is we can act as enforcement and, and a commitment technology. Many many of the reforms do not happen or do not are carried forward because of of this lack of intertemporal what we call intertemporal cooperation. So basically, the people who are in government today have very little expectation that the reforms that they they introduce today will be carried forward in the future so they know that you know by 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 constraining themselves are given you know are giving political ammunition to the opposition uh, in the future so one of the things we can work as is a, is an enforcement and commitment technology ensure this ensuring this country and this and this government officials that we are there today we are going to be there tomorrow and we are going to make sure that the commitments uh, are carried forward so i will stop thank here thank you very much carlos 21 minutes exactly. So, thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, such a comprehensive overview and for coming at the end to some very concrete ideas about what we can do to make things better. Before I move on to Jana, a reminder to all the online audiences that they're very welcome to put questions and comments through the chat room so that later on in the discussion we can also uh, take them into account.